In the previous lecture, we defined a quantity used in biochemistry known as the sedimentation coefficient. And we define this mathematically, so we define it by using an equation, the following equation. So the sedimentation coefficient of a particle inside a test tube that is rotating with some angular velocity is equal to m, the mass of that particle, multiplied by 1 minus v bar multiplied by rho, where v bar is the partial specific volume, it's the reciprocal of the density of that particle, and rho is the density of that medium, the fluid in which that particle is moving inside our test tube. And we divide the product by f, the frictional coefficient of that particle with respect to the fluid in which that particle is in. So the question that we want to ask ourselves in this lecture is, where exactly does this equation actually come from? So we want to derive this equation. So in biochemistry, this equation is used to describe or tell us the rate at which our object or particle sediments inside our test tube as it rotates in a centrifuge. So let's begin by imagining our picture. So what is taking place within our test tube as it rotates with some angular velocity? So let's suppose this is our test tube. The blue particle is some particle given by mass m. And this entire structure, the entire test tube is rotating in the following direction with a given angular uh, velocity of omega. Now, the distance from that particle to the axis of rotation is given by r. So this is the radius of the circle that is circumscribed by this rotating particle shown in blue. So before we begin our derivation, we want to ask ourselves, what are all the forces that are acting on that blue particle as it is rotating inside our test tube? So we have three forces acting on the particle. So let's suppose this is the x-axis. Going this way is the positive direction and going that way is the negative direction. So we have two negative forces and one positive force. The positive force is the centrifugal force and that causes our object to move in this direction. Now let's suppose that the other direction is the negative direction and we have two forces pointing in that negative direction. We have the force that is created by that fluid that basically pushes on that particle. And that is the buoyant force, that is Fb. And we also have the frictional force that is due to the electrostatic repulsion between the charges found on the fluid particles and this particle that we are examining. And that also opposes motion, points in the opposite direction. So these two points oppose, mo uh, these two forces oppose motion, and that's why they point in the opposite direction of motion, because our particle is moving in this direction as our test tube rotates. So the first question is, or the first step is in our derivation, what equation do we want to use? Well, we want to use the equation of motion in classical physics, and that is the second law of motion. So we know that the sum of all the forces acting on that particle along the x-axis is equal to the mass of that particle multiplied by its acceleration. Now, let's suppose that the velocity of that object, that particle, is constant. And what that means is, if the velocity is constant, then the acceleration is essentially equal to zero. And so that implies that the sum of the forces acting on that object along the x-axis is equal to zero. Now, with that in mind, let's actually see what the left side of this equation is. So let's take a look at all the forces acting on the object. So this is the positive force, and these are the two negative forces. So let's use red for that positive force. So we have this force here. It's positive minus and these are the two negative forces. So we're going to put them both in parentheses and set that equal to zero. So this implies that that is true. So we have our force of buoyancy and then we have 
the frictional force. So we have the buoyancy force, the frictional force. We put a positive here because this, when we open up our parentheses, the negative will make these negative. So that's why we put the positive inside. So we have our single positive force and we add the two negative for, uh, and we add the two negative forces and then we subtract the two values. So this is step number one. Now step number two is to, is to actually figure out what these three forces are. Well, recall from classical physics that we can represent the centrifugal force as simply, so our centrifugal force is equal to, so the red force F subscript C is equal to the mass of that object, the particle, the blue particle, which is assumed to be M, multiplied by its acceleration. In this particular case, because we're undergoing uh, angular motion, our, acceler uh, our acceleration is omega squared multiplied by R. Now, what is FB? What is the buoyant force? Well, once again, from classical physics, we know that the buoyant force is equal to not the mass of that particle, but the mass of the fluid that is displaced by that particle. So it's the mass of the fluid that is displaced by that particle. So we're going to designate that as M, this, where this is displaced. And it's multiplied by the acceleration, which is once again, omega squared multiplied by R. Now, what is the force frictional? Well, the force frictional is simply equal to the coefficient multiplied by the velocity of that object. So we have the frictional force is equal to the coefficient of friction multiplied by the velocity of that object. So these three forces are given by the following three equations. And now in step two, we basically want to replace all these forces with the right side of these equations. So this becomes, we have m omega squared r uh, minus, in parentheses, we have m displaced multiplied by omega squared r plus this quantity here. So the coefficient of friction multiplied by v and the sum is equal to zero. Now the question is, what exactly is the mass displaced? How else can we represent the displaced mass of that fluid that is displaced by that particle? Well, from fluid dynamics, we know that the mass displaced is equal to, so the mass displaced or the mass of the fluid that is displaced by that object is equal to the product of the mass of that object multiplied by the ratio of the density of the fluid to the density of that object. So let's call it a particle. Now let's, let's represent V bar because that is used in this equation. V bar is equal to one divided by the density of the particle. And if this is how we want to represent the density of the particle, then we can basically rewrite the following equation in the following way. So the mass, this is equal to the mass of that object multiplied by the top. So this stays here. So multiplied by uh, rho and let's just leave rho as rho and not rho fluid. So rho basically means rho fluid. And then because we're rewriting one divided by the density of the particle as V bar, we simply multiply by the V bar. So this is equal to this here. Now, if we go back to this equation, we can rewrite the M this in the following form. So let's make that step three. So in step three, we have mass multiplied by omega squared r minus, so let's keep that in parentheses. Actually, you know what, let's open up the parentheses. So we open up our parentheses, so this becomes negative and this becomes negative, and we also want to replace m this with the following uh, representation. So we have uh, the mass multiplied by the density of the fluid multiplied by v bar, which is simply one over the density of the particle multiplied by 
omega squared multiplied by r minus fv and the minus comes because we open up those parentheses and we set that equal to zero so this is a bit crooked so let's m omega squared r okay okay so the next step is to basically collect the terms that appear on this term and this term so we have m and m we have our omega squared and we have the r so this can be rewritten in the following method so we have m omega squared r multiplied by 1 minus v bar multiplied by rho minus fv is equal to 0. So once again, if we multiply this out, we get back this equation here. And that's why these are essentially equivalent. Now, in the next step, we want to bring this term f multiplied by v to the right side. And so we get m multiplied by omega squared multiplied by r multiplied by 1 minus v bar, uh, the density of the fluid, is equal to, is equal to f multiplied by v. Now, if we keep, if we keep the velocity on this side and bring the f to this side, we basically get the following result. So m omega squared r multiplied by 1 minus v bar rho is equal to v, and this is divided by, uh, no, not rho, but f, which is the frictional coefficient of that particle. Okay, and the last step is, well, our goal is to make this equation look like the right side of this equation. So notice that the right side of this equation has m, 1, v, bar, rho, and f, but it doesn't have the omega and r. So we want to bring the omega squared multiplied by r to the other side of the equation. And we basically obtain, uh, so we have v divided by uh, omega squared r is equal to m 1 minus v bar rho divided by f. And so this right side of this equation is the same as the right side of this equation. So we see because they are equal, we see that s, the sedimentation coefficient, is equal to v, the velocity of that object, divided by omega squared, where omega is the angular velocity, multiplied by r, where r is this, uh, this distance right over here. So we see that s is equal to v divided by uh, omega squared r, which is equal to m 1 minus v bar rho divided by f. And this is basically our derivation. Now, sometimes we express this in a slightly different way. So if we multiply this ratio top and bottom by some number, we're not going to change the value of it. So let's multiply top and bottom by Avogadro's number. So remember, Avogadro's number is given by uppercase NA, and this gives us Avogadro's number of molecules. So basically, uh, 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules. This is Avogadro's number. So if you multiply top and bottom by Avogadro's number, we won't change our result and we get Na multiplied by m multiplied by 1 minus v bar uh, the density divided by Na multiplied by f. So this doesn't change because we can simply cross this out and we get back our result. Now notice that Avogadro's number multiplied by the mass of that object gives us the molar mass of that object. Remember the molar mass of some particle is basically the mass of, of Avogadro's number of particles. So if we take this particle and we collect Avogadro's number, we get a mass value that is equal to Na multiplied by m. So this is another way of basically describing that same equation. So let's rewrite this with uppercase m, where uppercase m is, is our, uh, molar mass 
and the bottom stays as Na multiplied by F. So this is another equation that gives us that same sedimentation coefficient given by S. So these two equations here are equal to one another. The only difference is, in this case, we don't have Avogadro's number, we have the lowercase m, where m is the mass of that single particle, but in this case, uppercase m is the mass of Avogadro number of particles. So 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So this is how you basically derive this equation. It comes from basic physics.